Hi, I'm Ben with uh, Grace Community Church. I'm one of the pastors here, and I wanted to thank you for watching this sermon. I pray that it serves you well, that it will help you grow in your understanding of God's Word, the Bible, that it will deepen your love for Christ and help you to pursue holiness in your own life. And we are glad that you're here watching this video, but uh, we, we also pray that this video would not be a, a replacement for your own local church and sitting under the preaching and teaching of your own pastor. But we do pray that it, it helps you, that it edifies you. If you have any questions about this sermon or our church in general, feel free to visit our website, gracecommunitychurchberea.com, and hit the Contact Us button. We'll be happy to help you in any way that we can. And may God be glorified through your listening to this sermon. Well, earlier this week, I was running an errand for my wife. I was picking up a Christmas gift for one of our children, and as I was standing in the checkout line, I was noticing they had some National Geographic there that was talking about the Christmas season, and they had a couple other publications dealing with Christmas, and one that I didn't even know was still in existence was Life Magazine. I thought Life Magazine was long was part of the history books, but they had a uh, they had a a uh, edition there that had. A picture on it, a drawing that uh, was supposed to represent Jesus. And above the picture, they had in big block letters, Jesus, with the subtitle, Who Do You Say That I Am? And I found that to be rather interesting on a couple fronts. First of all, it's a pretty good marketing strategy to uh, put out uh, that kind of a cover at uh, Christmas time. Because it asked the question, obviously, it was asking the question that many people continue to ask today, and that is about Jesus. But I hope that for those who honestly ask that question, they don't turn to Life magazine, or they don't turn to any secular publication in order to seek the answer, because all they're going to find is something that's going to be less than satisfactory. But I did admire the publisher for this one thing, because they did get this one thing right. The publisher asked the right question. They posed the question, who do you say that I am? Not, who do you say that I was? And unwittingly, they asked the question in the present tense. And all they were doing, whether they realized it or not, and they probably didn't, they were pointing to the reality that Jesus Christ is alive and well, and he's ruling and reigning at the right hand of the Father's throne. And so I ask you again this morning, who do you say that I am? And really the question is a deeply theological one and therefore should be answered from the Bible. And let me caution you, Questions like this and others must be answered from the Bible. And in particular, when it comes to the identity of Jesus, we do not have the right to redefine Jesus as we would like him to be. And that's what many people are want to do. We do not have the right to redefine Jesus according to our own terms and our own ideas. When we talk about Jesus, we should never say, well, I think Jesus is. We should always say, Scripture says Jesus is. Our opinion really doesn't matter. And frankly, our opinion can do us great harm if it is not consistent with the biblical testimony. Nor do we have the right to redefine Jesus in our own image. We all want to do that, don't we? We want him to be more like us and act like we think that he should act. So we need to be careful about that. And just as another word of warning, be careful where you turn to for the answers to your theological questions. If you have theological questions, go to Scripture. Stay off the Internet. Okay. God will speak to you through His Word if you're earnestly seeking answers. Now, if you remember from the first ad, my first Advent message, the question on the magazine cover isn't original. Jesus asked the same question of His disciples in Matthew 16. 
Remember, he was asking about, hey, what do the scribes say? What do the Pharisees say? Then he turned to the disciple and he said, but who do you say that I am? Now, the significance of that is he asked them a very personal question. Who do you say that I am? Say, well, what do we take from that? Here's what we take from that. It matters what you think about Jesus. What you think about Jesus has a direct impact on your life. So he says to his disciples, but who do you say that I am? It's a question that you have to get right. You can't give somebody else's answer. Who do you say that I am? And who is Jesus? One of the most important questions that you and I could ever ask. Why? Because it's a question that has eternal implications. It's a question of life and death. It's a question that impacts our eternal destiny. And because it is such an important question, it is a question that must be answered correctly. You cannot understand the identity of Jesus apart from understanding the purpose for why Jesus came. I think I'm safe to say that with Jesus, identity equals purpose. Jesus Christ came to this earth with a purpose. You can't separate his purpose from his identity. So this is what Matthew is trying to do as he opens up his gospel. Matthew answers the question of who Jesus is while at the same time he reveals the purpose of Jesus. Previously, we examined how uh, Matthew partially identified Jesus. We've really only gotten to the word Jesus, and hopefully next week we'll get to the word Christ and Son of David and son of Abraham, but he has also revealed the purpose for which Jesus came. If you look back down at verse 21, the angel said to Joseph, she will bear a son and you shall call his name Jesus for, when you see that word for, you know what, you know what he's saying? Here's the purpose. Here's the reason. Here's the purpose for Jesus coming. Here's the reason for Jesus coming, for he will save his people from their sins. Again, let me briefly remind you that the word Jesus is the Greek form of the Hebrew word Joshua, and Joshua means the Lord saves, or the Lord is my salvation. Therefore, when we hear the word Jesus, what should we immediately think about? What should be the connection we make every time we hear the word Jesus? The Lord saves. The Lord is my salvation. You know, we ask, what's in a name? Well, here's what's in a name when we think about Jesus. The Lord is my salvation. The Lord saves. That's why it's so despicable to me for Jesus Christ to be used as a swear word, to be used as some kind of off-color comment, to express our anger or disgust. How dare we take the name of the one who came to save us and use it for, to further condemn us. Well, what did Jesus come to save us from? Well, again, the angel leaves us with absolutely no doubt. Jesus came to save us from our sins. I said this on week one. I'll say it again today and perhaps even next week. I hope you see what an incredible evangelistic opportunity Christmas time is. Do you think that Life magazine would go to the time and the expense to publish a Christmas edition that asked the question, who do you say that I am, if people weren't asking that question? I don't think so. And if people are asking that question, then you and I need to be ready to answer that question for them. We don't want them turning necessarily to the Internet or to some other source, wouldn't you rather have your friend, your loved one, your neighbor turn to you who knows who Jesus Christ really is so that you could help explain to them so that you could answer that question? And you could do that right here from Matthew chapter 1. Listen, you've got enough of the gospel right here in Matthew chapter 1 to lead a person to Christ, to explain to them not only who Jesus is, but why Jesus came. And how hard would it be during this time of the year to simply ask somebody, who do you think Jesus is? 
Obviously, people are thinking about it. You know, I was thinking about this earlier this morning. I wonder how many people have lost the connection between the identity of Jesus and the purpose of Jesus. How many people don't even really understand why Jesus and Christmas are even mentioned in the same breath? I think it would probably surprise us to know the number of people who really don't connect the dots when it comes to Jesus in Christmas time. So we could take them right here to Matthew chapter 1 and show them that Jesus is Emmanuel, that he is God with us. You know, many people think today that God has either forgotten us or forsaken us. And we can rebut that argument right here and show them, no, that is not true. Jesus Christ came to us, Emmanuel, God with us. We could show them that. We can show them that he has come to us. And you can show them that the reason that he has come to us was to save his people from their sins. And again, I think sometimes when we think about leading a person to Christ, we think we've got to know every verse in every book of the Bible. We don't. It'd be good to know as much of the Bible as we can, wrap our heads around in grass. But listen, there's enough of the gospel right here, Matthew chapter 1, in the Christmas story, for you to take it and to share the gospel with someone, and God could use that to bring them to Christ. So what are the implications of, Joseph, of, of the angel's words to Joseph? Well, really, I think the crystal clear implication is, that, is this. If Jesus came to save his people from their sins, then at least two things are true. One of which is, if Jesus came to save us from our sins, that means that we are what? We're sinners. We're sinners. Of course, we know this is consistent with what the Scriptures teach. There is none righteous, no, not one. Second, if Jesus came to save us from our sins, then that means that we are incapable of saving ourselves. So here we have a huge problem. We are sinners. But Jesus had to come to save us from our sins, so therefore we are incapable of saving ourselves from our sins. But what do we see today? Most people reject both of those realities. They reject outrightly that they are sinners. Oh, sure, they may do a little bad every once in a while, but overall they're pretty good people. How dare you say that I'm a sinner? Nobody wants to acknowledge that. Nobody wants to claim that. The second reality, well, that they reject is that we can't save ourselves. And again, people get upset over that. How dare you say that to me? I'm a pretty good person, and I think I've done enough good to outweigh whatever bad that I may have done in my lifetime. So we have this ongoing rejection of the reason that Jesus came. They don't, people don't believe that they're sinners or if they might begrudgingly just a little bit admit that, yeah, okay, maybe I'm a little bit of a sinner. I'm not a big sinner. I'm just a a little sinner, but still they think, well, I can save myself. I don't need the help of Jesus, but that's not true. Is it? Okay. If those things are true, if we're not sinners, and if we can't save ourselves, that means the angel was a liar. Are you ready to say that? So, who do we believe? Do we believe what we've been telling ourselves? That I'm good enough, that I'm really not all that bad, and that even if I have got a little sin in my life, surely I can do enough good to overcome the bad. Do we believe ourselves, or do we, do we believe God? There's only one right answer to that question. We must believe God. Now, let's focus on those words, he shall save his people from their sins. And here's what I want you to see here. I want you to see the faith of Joseph. The faith of Joseph. When the angel said to Joseph that the baby that Mary was carrying and that the name of the baby was Jesus and that this baby would save his people from their sins. I think, let's think this through. That was a statement that Joseph had to take by faith. Was it not? What evidence did he have 
that what the angel was saying to him was true, other than the angel was saying it. So he had to take this by faith. And some might say, well, Joseph was really just putting his faith in what the angel said. And I, I guess there's a certain amount of truth in that. But I think Joseph was not only putting his faith in what the angel said, but also in what the angel said Jesus came to do. I believe that Joseph believed that Jesus was indeed going to save his people from their sins. He may not have completely, and I'm sure he didn't completely understand all that that meant at that moment, but he did believe. He did believe that there was more going on than he could explain away. He did believe that not only was the way that Jesus was going to be born, but there was a special reason for Jesus to be born. And all that is to say Joseph put his faith in Jesus. You say, well, how do you know that? How can you say that? Well, I know that Joseph put his faith in Jesus because of his actions. So what actions? Well, what was his original plan? His original plan was, I don't want to embarrass Mary, but I don't want to marry her either. So I'm just going to kind of distance myself from this relationship. I don't want to cause her any shame, but uh, I'm just going to quietly uh, move on with my life. But he didn't do that, did he? What did he do? Well, look at verse 24. What, when Joseph woke from sleep, he did as the angel of the Lord commanded him. He took his wife. Now, why did he do that? He believed God. He had faith in God's word. But look at verse 25, but knew her not until she had given birth to a son. And now notice this. And he called his name, what's it say? Jesus. And Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. On some level, whatever understanding he had, he believed God. He had faith in Christ. He demonstrated his belief in what the angel said by doing what the angel said. He believed God. He obeyed God by calling him Jesus. Thus, we see the faith of Joseph. But there's something else we see here in the pronouncement of the angel. When the angel said to Joseph that Jesus would save his people from their sins, those words, that statement of fact, set the agenda for the life of Jesus. Again. Joseph probably didn't understand all that was going on. He didn't understand all the implication of the angel's words, but he knew there was something special about Jesus. You know, most parents want what is best for their children. Most parents have some hopes and dreams for their children. They may be modest or they may be grand, but they're there. But when a child comes into the world, there's no way that mom and dad knows for a certainty what their children will do or how they will turn out, except Joseph and Mary. They knew exactly what Jesus was going to do. They knew exactly what the agenda for his life was to be before he was ever born. You know, some parents think they know what their child is destined to become. I'm going to show my age here, but I'll do so for sake of illustration. Sept uh, February 22nd, excuse me, the February 22nd, 1988 edition of Sports Illustrated <laughs> had on the cover, had an article in it with the title, Bread to be a Superstar. And it had the subheadline: Todd Marinovich was groomed from infancy to be a top-notch quarterback. Now, if you're a college football fan or NFL fan, you may remember this guy's name. From birth, his father, when he was uh, one month old, his father began to stretch out his hamstrings. And he cut his teeth on frozen kidney. And his father had him trying to lift medicine balls before he could walk. His father used Eastern Bloc training methods and consulted 13 experts, including biochemists, psychologists, to build his quarterback. Sports Illustrated called him America's first test tube athlete. 
They called him the robo quarterback. Well, he did get a scholarship to USC, the University of South Carolina, who at that time, though they are not anymore at that time, they were a premier college football program. He was the number one pick in the 1991 NFL draft by the Oakland Raiders. It appeared that his father had correctly engineered his destiny. He was going to fulfill his destiny, but he didn't. He was the first pick in the 1991 NFL draft. It was just a few years later. He was a drug addict, and he was out of the NFL, never to be heard from again. I looked him up online. He's somewhere in his 50s, and uh, he looks more like he's well into his 70s. Say, what happened? Well, we think at times that we can set our own agenda or that we can design an agenda for our children, when in reality, only God can set the agenda. Only God designs the agenda. And the agenda that he had for his son was that he would save his people from their sins. And I'm sure Joseph never forgot the words of the angel that had a direct bearing, a direct impact on the way that he raised his children. Now, let me say this. Just because uh, some crazy dad tried to engineer his kid and to be a pro quarterback doesn't mean that we as parents shouldn't have goals and aspirations and desires for our children. Let me give you one that will never uh, uh, be refuted. Uh, God does have a goal for your children. God's goal for your children is for each one of them to glorify him and enjoy him forever. That's God's goal. That's where you start with your parenting, knowing that should have a direct impact on the way that you raise your children. I have heard parents say, and, and I, don't believe, I don't believe this was a Christian that said this. I would hope a Christian would never say this. But I have heard a parent say that um, they were not going to influence their children when it came to matters of religion. They were just going to let them find their own way. Listen, their way has already been found. So what do you mean? The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? If you leave your children to go their own way in matters of religion, they'll go their own way. They'll go their own way. They'll cause you heartache. They'll cause you grief. You wonder where you went wrong. Listen, as a Christian, it is a dereliction of your God-given duty as parents to point them to Christ, to let them know that they are responsible for their actions to their creator. That they can't do whatever they please and think that there's no consequences to it. That is your responsibility, mom and dad. That's your job. And if you don't teach them that they're sinners in need of a savior, if you don't teach them that their heart from birth is opposed to God and will be and will, because of their sinful nature, they will ignore God, and they will turn completely away from God. That is a, all I can say is that is a, is a terrible dereliction again of your duties. And please, 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 make sure you raise your children according to Scripture, and not the Internet, not some best-selling author. Can some of those things be helpful? Yes, but do not go to them first. I've said this before. Ask me how many parenting books I've read. I don't recall reading one, but this one. Now, I'm not saying that there aren't some wise people out there that can help you, but don't don't start there first. See what God has to say. Raise your children according to Scripture. God does have an agenda for your child so that you might glorify Him, glorify Him, enjoy Him forever. All right. Something else I see here in the words of the angel. 
And that is that the words of the angel to Joseph were a statement, though Joseph probably didn't realize it at the time, they were a statement of God's covenant faithfulness. Ben taught on God's covenant on Wednesday night. And that's what we're seeing here. The words of the angel were a statement of God keeping his words. The words of the angel were actually the fulfillment of God's promise. And do you know what these words of the angel reveal about God? These words reveal that God is reliable, that God is faithful, and God is dependable. God promises in Genesis 3 that he would send one who would crush the head of Satan. And guess what? Here we have the fulfillment of God's promise. God is keeping his word right here. You know, when we think about the incarnation of Jesus, and I hope that you are taking some time to just think about the wonder of the incarnation, to think about the fact that somehow God came to us in human flesh. And as you think about that, you, I'm sure you'll begin to experience a whole range of emotions. I mean, how can we not think of the incarnation without experiencing emotions of wonder and awe? Or we experience thanksgiving over what the incarnation means for us. Do you realize if the incarnation not had happened, we would be lost and doomed and damned forever? It's an important event in history. And so understanding that, we should what? We should express great thanksgiving, and we wish we had better words to express our gratitude. When we think about the birth of Jesus, we can experience joy and peace. But there's one emotion that we can never, ever say that we experience because of the incarnation, and that is disappointment. Why? Because Jesus is the fulfillment of God's promise. This is a demonstration of the reliability of God. This is God's covenant faithfulness in action. God is reliable. You can take it to the bank. It's a check that won't bounce. It's a check that you can cash. Of course, we know this isn't the only instance of God keeping his word. We have other instances in Scripture. For instance, every time we look to the cross, what do we see? We see the faithfulness of God. Sinclair Ferguson says, Nothing, not even the instinct to spare his own son, will turn him back from keeping his word. Think about that. Go home and listen to this again. Write down that statement. Think about that. Not even the instinct of sparing his own son would keep him from being faithful. You say, well, how do we know that Jesus would indeed save his people from their sins? Well, the Gospels contain numerous accounts that help us understand that. Let me give you three or four. Number first one is in Matthew chapter 8, the disciples cried out to the Lord in the middle of a storm. They said, save us, Lord, we are perishing. Did they perish? No. Jesus rebuked the winds and the waves, and there was not just calm, but if you ever notice how Matthew records it, there was great calm. I take that to mean there is a calm like none of them had ever experienced before. So when Jesus says, my peace I give to you, not like the peace of the world, you know what that peace is? It's a great calm. It's like nothing we've ever experienced before. In Matthew chapter 9, verse 27, two blind men are doing their best to follow Jesus. And they're crying out, have mercy on us, son of David. Jesus goes into a house and they make their way into the house. And Jesus said to them, do you ask them if they believe that he could actually give their sight back to them. And they said, yes, they believed. And Jesus said to them, according to your faith, be it done to you. And Matthew rec records, and their eyes were opened. Earlier in Matthew chapter 9, verses 2 through 6, we read, and behold, some people brought to him a paralytic lying on a bed. And when Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralytic, take heart, my son, your sins are forgiven. And behold, some of the scribes said to themselves, this man is blaspheming. But Jesus, knowing their thoughts, said, Why do you think evil in your hearts? For which is easier to say, Your sins are forgiven, or to say, Rise and walk, but that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. He then said to the paralytic, Rise, pick up your bed, and go home. Now, did you catch what Jesus said there? He said, But that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to do what? Forgive sins. 
That's how we know that what the angel said is reliable, it's truthful, it's dependable. For he shall save his people from their sins. And we have these instances of it. St. Clair Ferguson has written a, really a, a wonderful little book um, called Child in the Manger. That's the title. And he had this little excerpt in there that I, I want to read for you. I think it's just absolutely marvelous. He says, imagine that you were alive perhaps 35 years or so after the birth of Jesus, and you were able to tour Israel. You might meet a man you hear was once blind and ask him, how come you are now able to see? He would reply, Jesus saved me. Then he might meet a deaf man who could now hear perfectly and ask, how on earth did you get your hearing back? The answer would be the same. Jesus saved me. You could also meet a man who once had been a leper living in enforced separation from his wife and family and ask him, what happened to you? Again, the same answer, Jesus saved me. And in the street, you might see a man happily walking alongside four of his friends. Someone might say to you, do you see that man over there? He was once paralyzed, but now look at the way he's walking. But as you move towards him, the man goes into a house, leaving only his four friends. So you ask them, is it true that your friend was once paralyzed? How then is he able to walk today? And as one, their faces would break into wide grins as they responded, Jesus saved him. He told him his sins were forgiven and commanded him to walk. Do you want to know the whole story? See, all these things are proof that what the angel said about Jesus was absolutely true. They all point to the reliability of God's word. So what do we take away from this today? Well, first... Jesus does indeed possess the ability to save his people from their sins. The Bible says, as many as received him, to them gave he the right to become what? The sons of God. Jesus also said, come unto me, all you who are weary and heavy burdened, and I will give you rest. Again, evidence is that his promises are true, that he's reliable, faithful, and absolutely dependable. Second, this is proof of who he is. Even the Pharisees knew that only God could forgive sins. In Luke 5, 21, the scribes and the Pharisees began to question, saying, Who is this who speaks blasphemies? Who can forgive sins but God alone? You know what Jesus was doing? Jesus was forcing them to answer the question, Who do you say that I am? How can you refute all the things that you've seen me do? In fact, Jesus said one time, hey, if you don't believe my words, believe my works. How do you explain this? And I would say to the skeptic today, how do you explain this? There's only one correct answer, and that's the answer of Peter. You are the Christ. You are the son of the living God. You are Jesus who saves his people from their sins. You are indeed Emmanuel, God with us. Let me close this morning with probably... C.S. Lewis's most famous quote. C.S. Lewis said, I believe it was in Mere Christianity, he said, I am trying here to prevent anyone saying the really foolish thing that people often say about him. I'm ready to accept Jesus as a great moral teacher, but I don't accept his claim to be God. That is the one thing we must not say. A man who was merely a man and said the sort of things Jesus said would not be a great moral teacher. He would either be a lunatic on the level with the man who says he's a poached egg, or else he would be the devil of hell. You must make your choice. Either this man was and is the son of God, or else a madman or something worse. You can shut him up for a fool. You can spit at him and kill him as a demon, or you can fall at his feet and call him Lord and God. But let us not come with any patronizing nonsense about his being a great human teacher. He has not left that open to us. He did not intend to. So really, there's just one thing for me to ask you, do you recognize him as the Son of God? Do you recognize him as Lord? Are you plain? Do you recognize that he came to save you from your sins? Have you come to him as Savior? Examine yourselves to see whether you be in the faith.